In this episode, we shed light on two lost Dalek television drama productions, one which was never made, and another which was, but is missing from the archives. It featured authentic props, operators, Peter Hawkins as the voices, and even the TARDIS, but it was not Doctor Who. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss our final episode and news of Series 2. It was not unheard of for the Daleks to make appearances in other shows, some more frivolous than others, such as here in the Wayne and Shuster comedy series in 1965. But in the spring of 1966, events were set in motion which nearly ensured the Daleks would get their own television series away from Doctor Who. Terry Nation wanted to make it big in America, where the real money and prestige were. His agent, Beryl Virtue, spoke to American television networks about the potential of science fiction and her contact with a wealthy American toy manufacturer called Fred Alper led him to become a key backer in the project to get a Dalek serial off the ground. The idea was mooted to feature elements that Nation had created for his previous serial, the Dalek's master plan, namely the Space Security Service and the character of Sarah Kingdom, played by Jean Marsh. The series was referred to in paperwork simply as the Daleks, but to avoid confusion, it's become better known over the years by the title of the pilot episode, The Destroyers. Alper had a meeting with BBC Television Enterprises on the 16th of May, 1966, just as William Hartnell was about to almost witness the gunfight at the OK Corral on BBC One. Following a second meeting a week and a half later, which included Nation himself, the writer went away to work on a pilot script and figure out a budget. A couple of days after that, Fred Alper wrote to Dennis Skuse at BBC Enterprises saying that Nation had made a really good start on the pilot and that the script would be finished within a couple of weeks. Also in development at that time was the third Dalek Annual, which would be entitled The Dalek Outer Space Book. Now with the Destroyers in development, Nation and his colleague Brad Ashton strategically included the characters from the spin-off pilot episode in the comic strips and stories. As such, the Dalek Outer Space book was designed to create familiarity with the proposed new series and make the pitch a more attractive prospect, since the public would see the Space Security Service, Sarah Kingdom and new character Mark Seven in action. August came and went with no word from Nation. September arrived and the Outer Space book was published featuring Sarah Kingdom and her fellow agents. Three weeks into October, Nation finally produced the pilot script, which was received well, and the budget landed on the BBC's desk at the start of November. The costings included four principal cast members paid £150 each, Dalek voice artists, presumed to be Peter Hawkins and David Graham, paid £70 each, four Dalek operators at £10 each, plus other small parts and extras. Because of his current work on the TV series The Baron, Nation was keen for his new Dalek programme to be in colour, believing it would sell more merchandise. The BBC reaction wasn't entirely enthusiastic. Firstly, they pointed out his budget made no allowance for the colour prints, and the two colour Doctor Who movies already meant that a colour Dalek TV series was not a unique prospect. Furthermore, they warned Nation that the BBC had very serious reservations as to the audience pull of the Daleks at this late stage. It seemed the American market might be the only place that more money could be made. And so in a letter dated the 11th of November 1966, it was confirmed that a US network was where the pilot would be aimed at, although it would most definitely be a British show. Apparently America's ABC network had read Nation's pilot script and responded favourably as long as the series was an adult science fiction programme and not aimed at children. Nation suggested to the BBC that he would go ahead with the project with or without the corporation's help. A budget was suggested of around £40,000, which was an astronomical figure by the BBC standards. It was ten times the cost of a similar single episode of Doctor Who. The analysts went away to look at their spreadsheets. Meanwhile, Patrick Troughton's debut adventure was being recorded in Riverside Studio One, with the Doctor battling his old enemies in Power of the Daleks, written by David Whittaker, for which Terry Nation received £15 per episode. Part four of this adventure was recorded on the 12th of November, 1966. The reason that Nation was pushing for a quick deal and making comments about going ahead without the BBC was because there was a time constraint. 
For the destroyers to be marketed to America, the pilot would have to be ready by February 1967 in order to meet the requirements of the American buying season. It was only three months to design, shoot and edit a half-hour film production. A meeting with Twickenham Film Studios was hastily set up, and on the 14th of November the studios sent a letter confirming that for the agreed sum of £600, they would make available two film stages, cameras and all associated facilities for Terry Nation's Dalek production for 10 days shooting starting on the 5th of December 1966. This left just six weeks to make the production for the Americans. For the UK broadcast, possibly in autumn of 1967, it would have to be shown on BBC Two, since that was the only colour service available at the time. The director lined up was Gordon Fleming, who had finished shooting the Dalek movie eight months previously. The BBC indicated that they'd be prepared to draw up a draft agreement covering the production of the pilot episode only, but the American backer, Alpa, on the other hand, wanted an agreement in place for the whole series, and he wanted distribution rights. He was told there was no time for such complex agreement or they'd miss the production date due to legal issues. Nation then scrambled to get hold of some actual Daleks ahead of filming. His agent Beryl Virtue wrote on his behalf to Dennis Skews at the BBC asking if they could borrow four of the props used in Doctor Who. Power of the Daleks was due to finish in studio on November the 26th so it was hoped that an arrangement could be made. However, as we discussed in episode 2, Around this time, there just happened to be another source of Dalek props available. On the 13th of October 1966, John Gale Productions advertised for sale the contents of their theatre production, The Curse of the Daleks, which had finished earlier in the year, and whose props had been used for the shoot of the movie, Daleks Invasion Earth 2150 AD. So within weeks of this advert appearing, we have evidence of Terry Nation trying to procure Dalek props for his series, and this footage from Wicker's World the following year shows that, for an unknown reason, Terry Nation had become the owner of four Dalek props. Borrowing the BBCs was all very well if the show went ahead with them on board, but he had said he'd go elsewhere for funding if need be, in which case he would require Daleks of his own. And, as shown in our previous investigation, we know this prop was refurbished from its original gold colour scheme to become a vibrant red. The script for the Destroyers featured a red Dalek. The evidence therefore points to this footage showing the four Dalek props which were lined up to feature in the Dalek spin-off series. Following more wranglings over budget, Dennis Skews requested approval for the £20,000 budget from the Director of Television on the 16th of November, which would allow the project to go ahead. On the 22nd of November, draft agreements between the BBC and Nation were drawn up, but despite the BBC's emphasis of what the agreement should and should not cover, Alper ensured the document secured him distribution rights in the American market, not just in the United States, but Central and South America, and the draft agreement covered the whole series, not just the pilot. Paragraph 12 also stated the BBC could not repeat any Dalek episodes from here on, or make new ones. The BBC were also required to cancel all existing license agreements. It did say, however, that if the Destroyers didn't turn into a series, then the Daleks would be allowed to return to Doctor Who from 1968 onwards. This draft agreement arrived on John Grove's desk at BBC Enterprises on Doctor Who's third birthday. Not surprisingly, at this point, things began to unravel. The agreement in this form was, as Alpa had been warned, unsuitable, or put less politely, nonsense. Part of the reason this contract was nonsense was that Nation himself had cooperated with and financially benefited from the licensing agreements which were already in place and stretching into 1968. He had taken advances on royalties for future revenue, so BBC Enterprises were dumbfounded as to how they would go about cancelling the agreements with merchandisers from whom money had already been received. The true extent of this mess became clear when the director of Twickenham Film Studios contacted John Grove about the situation. The studios had their own agreement with Terry Nation, so they had booked the Destroyers in as of that date, and they had turned down four weeks of other work to do so. Because of the impossibly short deadline on the production, Twickenham Film Studios had forged ahead in good faith, and construction on the Dalek episode was already underway. But this raises several questions. What could construction mean other than set building? That would mean designers had been employed and plans drawn up. Had props and costumes also been made? Why, after five decades, has no such evidence surfaced? What about casting and actors' contracts? Speaking in 1999, Jean Marsh, who had played Sarah Kingdom, was completely unaware that the series had ever been in development. I might have done it for a short time, for fun, but I wouldn't have done it for five years or anything. I liked playing Sarah Kingdom, 
but I do think that eight episodes was enough. How could Nation's main star be completely oblivious to the fact that her own show had got as far as having filming dates booked in a studio, and with £2,000 already expended, as claimed by Alpa and Nation's solicitors, feeling that events were running out of control, John Groves asserted the BBC's position that no suitable agreement had ever been drawn up, no budget procured, and that all discussions had been hypothetical, but he nonetheless sent off the script to David Attenborough, controller of BBC Two, to inquire whether this channel would be interested in broadcasting such a programme, should it ever come to fruition. Head of Serials Sean Sutton gave his thoughts on the pilot, basically that it was shallow but fun. And he interestingly notes that Sarah Kingdom is, of course, now a regular in various Dalek publications, exactly as Nation had contrived it to be. But the Alpa and Nation camp reacted badly to Enterprise's cautionary comments. They accused the BBC of pulling out of the deal and complained that they had proceeded in good faith following positive meetings. If the project was now abandoned, Alpa and Nation had incurred costs that they would not see back. They very magnanimously said they would not ask for the BBC to contribute to these costs. However, there was just the small matter of the rights of the Daleks. Mr Nation's solicitors said he was keen to get his series made, so if the BBC wouldn't mind just signing over all the rights to the Daleks, then Mr Nation could get on with making it. A bewildered BBC Enterprises responded by saying that firstly, the draft agreement was still with their legal team, secondly, they were waiting for decisions on approval for the budget, and thirdly, if Nation and Alpa are going ahead without BBC backing, how can it also be abandoned? Seeing no logical reason that the project would not continue, Enterprises politely replied that they could perhaps complete negotiations soon. By this time, it was mid-December, and Nation and Alpa solicitors' reply insisted that the 1967 buying season was going to be missed, and all was lost. They also stated that their clients didn't wish to argue over past history, and that they had no desire to continue to attempt to deal with the BBC. They asked for confirmation that the BBC would now hand over all the rights to the Daleks. They were prepared to grant the BBC 2.5% on any future profits. The existing arrangement already gave the BBC 50%. On the 23rd of December, the BBC's position on the matter was effectively decided by David Attenborough. For one thing, he thought it improbable that his BBC Two channel could be allowed to steal the Daleks away from the controller of BBC One, but for another, he had only 30 hours of programming at his disposal, and he had no place for such a series. Meanwhile, the rumblings about losing the Daleks had made their way to the Doctor Who production office, but with no agreement yet signed which prevented Dalek series being made by the BBC, David Whittaker was able to be commissioned to write a storyline, which he submitted on the 4th of January. He was formally commissioned to write the script on the 24th of January, just two days before the next round of talks began, which was designed to take the Daleks away from Doctor Who. Terry Nation, Beryl Virtue and Tony Bostock attempted to hammer out a deal which would allow the Destroyer's pilot and subsequent series to be made. The corporation would get a paltry £15 for every spin-off episode which featured the Daleks, in reflection of the paltry £15 that Terry Nation was paid whenever the BBC used them in another writer's story. The BBC emphasised that it couldn't cancel any existing licences or halt any overseas agreements that were in place and that some things would have to run their course. They agreed not to repeat any Doctor Who episodes with the Daleks and not make any new Dalek stories. But the wheels were already in motion for Evil of the Daleks, so it seems as if this would be one of those things that was allowed to run its course. It looked as if the BBC had just squeezed in one final Dalek story before that avenue was closed off to them. And in a letter dated the 2nd of February, the BBC head of copyright confirmed in writing that Terry Nation was agreeing to license the coming serial only on the condition that the BBC do their best to ensure it was screened before the end of September or the end of the year at the absolute latest. This seemed to be all that was needed for the spin-off series to get underway. But the Nation camp chewed it over and on the 20th of March they said they felt they couldn't launch a series without more control over the Daleks. They therefore said that the contract should be very slightly tweaked to add film rights comics, annuals, books, games, records, stage plays and radio broadcasts. The BBC agreed, as long as the restrictions related only to the launch of the spin-off series. Evil of the Daleks went before the cameras in April, but in June, the two opposing legal departments were still trying to nail down the details of the rights agreements for the Destroyers. Midway through broadcast of Evil of the Daleks, Dennis Skews wrote a written summary of the whole torrid affair and noted that as of that time there had been no word from Nation for months. 
He said that if nothing came of any of this, he was sure Nation would return to writing for Doctor Who on the same terms as before. And whilst it's often said that Evil was designed to clear the way for Terry Nation's new series, surely this was not an effective method of dovetailing into a new story. The Daleks have been utterly defeated, they are absolutely gone for good, and you'll never see them again on television. Tune in next week to see the Daleks, in colour, in the Destroyers, over on our rival, ITV. Nation would later recall that having gone to the United States, he got very close to doing it. But what meetings took place and what deals nearly happened, we may never know. We do know that the Destroyers was not made. And it seems the embargo on the Dalek repeats was never enforced. Only nine months later, Peter Bryant sought clearance to repeat Evil of the Daleks, which Nation granted. There was then talk of the Daleks returning to Doctor Who to battle the Cybermen, although Nation didn't want his creations being overshadowed by another villain, so this never came to fruition. Despite the Destroyers not being made for television, 50 years later an audio adaptation was made by Big Finish Productions, so the essence of this lost adventure can now be enjoyed. But of course the famous villains would return to the BBC only 12 months after the repeat of Evil of the Daleks, but in a most unexpected way, and not in Doctor Who. At that time, there were six props doing the rounds, although one lived in the workshops of Shawcraft, who originally built them. It was by this point fairly typical for the Daleks to be loaned out for charity and publicity, and their first known appearance after recording their final end was this fundraising drive for a swimming pool in Andover, alongside local band The Trogs. The United Reform Church at Maldon in June 1967 saw a different Dalek, also painted with a black dome. It was the same prop which appeared when the BBC launched their colour transmitter service in South Wales. Then, in October, the aliens were back in Wales for this visit to BBC Cardiff. A month later, this photo shoot for Blue Peter saw three Daleks help launch the Designer Monster competition, and a couple of days after that, this publicity stunt took place on Downing Street, fundraising for cancer relief. Running into the new year of 1968, two Daleks appeared at the Boys and Girls exhibition at Olympia. And then, in April, the monsters flanked Patrick Moore on the sky at night. That summer, season three of the anthology series Out of the Unknown was being made, and just like Doctor Who, it had been created under the supervision of Sidney Newman. Irene Shubik had approached Newman with the desire to make a science fiction version of Armchair Theatre, and television writers were drafted in to adapt works by known science fiction authors such as Isaac Asimov. One such writer was Terry Nation, who adapted Ray Bradbury's The Fox in the Forest for series one. Now, 12 months after the Destroyer's debacle, Terry Nation was contacted by the Out of the Unknown production team, but this time it was concerning rights issues. A short story had been found in Astounding Science Fiction, published 20 years prior, called Dreams Are Sacred, which was chosen for adaptation into an episode of Out of the Unknown. The original story was written by Peter Phillips and featured a dream world battle of wills in which bug-eyed monsters are conjured by one of the protagonists and the other responds by creating a phone booth in order to call the cops. And at the end of the story, he dreams up a Colt 45 and uses it to an attacking creature. Producer Alan Bromley was keen to broaden the appeal of the story and the idea was hatched that the generic monsters could be replaced with more familiar icons of British television, the Daleks. But they would need the permission of Terry Nation. After the previous year's tug of war over rights, the production team had a backup plan. They would approach Kit Peddler and Jerry Davis for use of the Cybermen instead. Thankfully, there was no issue, and plans went ahead with David Climey drafting the script adaptation, retitled Get Off My Cloud. On the 8th of August 1968, three of the available Dalek props arrived at Ealing Studios. Three experienced Dalek operators were employed, Kevin Manser, Robert Jewell, and Murphy Grumbar. The first sequence for which the Daleks were needed was a flashback set in a remote farmhouse. The young character of Pete Parnell, played by Robert Duncan, had nightmares about the Daleks from Doctor Who bursting into his room. Although this episode is lost from the archives, a very short audio recording survives of this scene. The quality isn't the best, but it's the only surviving record of Peter Hawkins' dialogue, which was recorded on the 22nd of August, 1968. In the scene, young Pete has told his father about his nightmares, and Parnell Sr. shows him a photograph of a cowboy's Colt 45. His dad's idea is to implant this into the dream so that young Pete can defend himself. When the boy falls asleep and has another nightmare, the photo appears in the dream, and he's able to lift it from its frame. Here's how the scene sounded.
Now an adult, Peter Parnell, played by Donald Donnelly, relates his childhood experience to a psychiatrist, Peter Barkworth. The concept of the episode was that Parnell could have his average mind linked up to that of a mentally ill science fiction writer called Marsham Craswell, played by Peter Jeffrey, in the hope of balancing his troubled fantasies. The technology which links the two minds allows them to meet in the dream world. In the next rare clip, Pete Parnell arrives in the desert of the fantasy world where Marsham Craswell is in a pulp science fiction outfit, and it features a brief cut back to the hospital bed where the real Craswell is upset at the intrusion into his dreams. How do you do? Marsham Craswell, I presume? No, no, go away! Oh, you certainly do answer. Over a minute ago, you were white as a bed sheet. You, you are an earth man. What? In the next clip, Parnell decides to telephone for help to fight the dragons they're facing, and he conjures up a phone box to place the call. But, to dovetail with the use of the Daleks, the Doctor Who iconography was applied here too, and the Out of the Unknown production team borrowed the genuine TARDIS prop. Its last studio use had been here, in Episode 5 of The Mind Robber, recorded on the 19th of July, 1968. Note that the phone panel has no handle, as that part of the original TARDIS was never designed to be opened. But a few days after its use in Out of the Unknown, on the 3rd of September, it was returned to Doctor Who for this location work for the invasion. You can see that the phone panel now has a handle fitted, and when the door is open, there is a proper phone cupboard visible inside. These modifications were made for Out of the Unknown, to give the TARDIS the practical phone element so that the character of Pete could open the door and call his friend the police sergeant. Here is another off-air clip. Again, the quality is poor, but the scene would have shown the TARDIS prop in use. By a strange quirk of fate, just after Out of the Unknown was recorded, the Doctor Who story The Mind Robber was broadcast, and their storylines were remarkably similar. It too featured nightmares which became real, and was set in a fantasy world which could be altered by those inside it. It also concluded with two men linked by a machine that allowed them to exert their willpower in a creative battle. In an added twist, due to a lack of time and money, the Doctor Who production team also borrowed costumes which had been used on an earlier episode of Out of the Unknown, called The Prophet. A perfect symmetry therefore came about, whereby Out of the Unknown borrowed monsters from Doctor Who to be the villains of one dream world, whilst Doctor Who borrowed monsters from Out of the Unknown to be the villains of another. And in doing so, Out of the Unknown changed the appearance of the TARDIS prop in Doctor Who. Perhaps one day it will be returned to the archives for us to enjoy the first and only appearance of the 1960s Dalek props in colour. The monsters flanked Patrick Moore on the sky at night. <laughs> Such a child. <laughs>